I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk more about examples and I'm going to show you um, examples in uh, technical details to some degree so not that many fancy words it's going to be rough roughly LLVM and HPC but that could mean anything and nothing so you'll you'll see what it means I modified the slides after our conversation last night so I hope to have included all the things we talked about at least at least to some degree uh, which will also be a little you know will be a little interesting it's the first time that the slides are in order, order for me as well so some of them are even new let's let's just go so I'll give these talks and I give a lot of these talks but but LLVM especially LLVM OpenMP is not me I mean there's a lot of people involved and, and it's everyone from you know people that do the the actual coding to the people that test the stuff and actually report back and try it out on big applications, uh, academics that write papers and have new ideas and try stuff out. So I haven't updated that slide for a long, long time. I made that and I should always show that slide, but it, the whole many, many more gives you the idea. It's like me giving a talk, but not me doing the work. I'm, I'm just, I'm just a, the pretty face that they put in front of the people. <clears throat> I'm not sure why they laugh there, but sure. Uh, so, so a little bit about me. So this is me at ETH, overlooking Zurich. Um, I did a PhD in, in Zabrücken, um, then joined Argonne National Lab to work with Hal Finkel. Um, and then last year I joined Livermore in the, in the Bay Area. I do mostly, when I talk to people, I do either LLVM or OpenMP or both. So that's, that's my spiel. So that's what I do. Um, technically now, since 2021, I'm officially the LLVM OpenMP code owner for whatever that means. All right, let's talk a little bit about LLVM. Yesterday in the talk, I already talked, like I, I gave a, an intro into LLVM and uh, talked a little bit about, um, a, a lot about the community and how to get in touch. So I'll, I'll, I won't re, like, redo all of it. I will though say it is an open community and people should get in touch even researchers people that have questions people that are like oh can i even like can i can lvm do this for me and then you like people I, I meet people all over the place that say oh i wanted to do that but i i couldn't find an lvm so i wrote my own solution and that doesn't really work but it kind of works and so on and so forth instead of just asking someone because half of it already is there or they can at least give you advice on how to do it and so on and they do it for free and they don't judge the worst case is nobody answers you that's literally the worst case. It, what do you have to lose? It's really, it's, it's, it's that easy. And then there's even, you don't even have to post on, you know, our forum mailing list where everyone can see it. You can even go into the office hours that people offer and just talk to the people. There's no record. Nobody's going to steal your ideas or whatever. You know, pe people are way too busy to do that. Um, there's a lot of meetings every week, every two weeks, every four weeks about all sorts of topics. Um, there is a, a Google calendar, LLVM, calendar whatever google uh, i would recommend just taking a look at that it has almost all of the things in there so you 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 can also you know get the the uh the stuff for your calendar from there so that's kind of nice okay lvm open mp i'm not going to talk much about you know how the sausage is made how is everything implemented how how do we do how do we get the sequential semantics of OpenMP onto a, onto a GPU and how, to, how do we try to make that fast? There is a three hour tutorial on YouTube for everyone that is interested um, that I usually tell people to you know, first go and watch. And it has, it, has like a, it has some of the things I'm talking about today, but it has like a lot of details also like how things are done. Um, you can probably, you know, fast forward or increase the speed to make it less, like, more bearable. But, but it's 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 a, a nice resource. Uh, one thing to LLVM OpenMP I want to say is kind of the direction I see things going, because big picture seems big picture is good. If you know where what the big picture, you know, may be, or the, at least what I think it should be, um, that might help you to orient yourself and also make decisions for what you're planning to do in the future. This is a rough sketch of how OpenMP is compiled in the LLVM framework and compiled and executed. So you have a program that uses OpenMP, uh, either C, C++, or Fortran, right? C, C++, it goes through Clang. Clang is an OpenMP-capable C, C++ compiler, or through Flang. And then it ends up in, at the end, in LLVM IR plus OpenMP runtime calls. That's, that's where it ends up. 
And then we do OpenMP aware optimizations on that. And then we interact with the OpenMP runtime to get that to execute on the CPU, GPUs, FPGA, uh, to JIT it at runtime, to run it on a virtual GPU, to offload it to remote GPUs somewhere in the cloud. Um, yada, yada. So we, we have all of this. This is rough, this, roughly the setup, right? Now, you can think of it, there's other offloading languages, and OpenMP is not the only game in town. So there's CUDA, there's HIP, there's SICL, there's uh, OpenCL, and so on and so forth. So how does, that, how does that fit in here? And what I envision is that it fits in here in a way that we all meet here. Everyone meets there. And at that point, now I still call it OpenMP IR Builder, OpenMP Runtime calls OpenMP Runtime. At that point, forget the OpenMP. Just call it offload runtime, LLVM offload runtime. It, it's, the, the goal is that people can write whatever they, they want on the left. They can even mix and match. And they all end up at the same place, which allows us to do cross-language optimizations, which allows us to only maintain, implement, and improve a single runtime, a single optimizer, and so on and so forth, and which allows us to get all of this. So we get you know, portability, interoperability. And, and all of the you know, tooling that we're building, we only have to build it once. We don't have to build it five times. And there's no like, like a, a huge diversity in, oh, if you use CUDA, you have you know, these capabilities. But if you use HIP, you have these other capabilities. That's not helping anyone. I mean, for users, what they want is they want to freely pick this and hopefully mix and match them. And it, it's supposed to run fast everywhere. And they should always want to have the same experience. And we can give them that if we want to. And it's not only me that wants this. There's other people, including industry, that, that are very interested in this. When and if that happens, we'll see. We're working on it. One thing to show, wait, sorry. Um, one of those, like the blue arrows here, are research prototypes in the sense of there is code that does this. There is a proof of concept. And one of those, one of those blue ones I'm actually going to talk about, and that is the CUDA to CUDA Clang to OpenMP runtimes. So you start with CUDA and you lower it onto the OpenMP runtimes. And then you can target the virtual GPU on the host, like run CUDA code on your CPU, or you can target an AMD GPU with your CUDA code. Because maybe you buy a lot of AMD GPUs and you want to not throw away your CUDA code. So how do we do this? So we basically treat OpenMP as an intermediate layer, right? So this is, again, a more you know, detailed view of what I just showed. You have some, some input file, OpenMP, goes into Clang. Clang splits it into device and host compilation. And um, into the device compilation, we have the runtime, which is target dependent. So, so it depends on what you actually target, NVPTX, AMD GCN. There's different you know, intrinsics used, and so on and so forth. So this stuff is, is, is piped into the device code. Uh, the vendor runtimes are piped in, so the vendor runtimes give us hooks into you know, math functions and so on. So we pipe those all in, and then we embed that into the host object file, and then we execute it with lib -omb target on you know, virtual GPU, AMD, NVIDIA. So this is the current state of the art upstream LLVM OpenMP offload. And um, so we're working on Intel right now. We're also working on Apple GPUs right now. Um, so there will be you know, some diversity here. So it's, it's actually useful. Now, for this work, the first thing we did is we, we, we put uh, a target independent math library here. Um, that helped us to get rid of some target dependencies in the front end because of math. Then we said, OK, now we take CUDA and we want to, Clang is also a CUDA compiler capable of CUDA analysis, CUDA semantic analysis, and code generation. So we use CUDA and, and Clang and just um, feed it into Clang. And we let Clang generate what it always generates for CUDA. So we didn't actually change that part. We let Clang interpret CUDA the way it interprets it and generate what it generates. But what we did is we provided um, header wrappers for the APIs and the built-ins such that Clang generates a call to, you know, KU kernel launch, something like that. And we provide an implementation of KU kernel launch in this file that then we kind of transparently pipe that into Clang every time. And then Ku kernel launch is implemented as you know, OpenMP kernel launch. And here we go. So we basically just implement all the CUDA functions through OpenMP functionality. Not necessarily pragma-omp, 
but things that call into the OpenMP runtime. Now you can do that for hip and sickle as an exercise, obviously as well. I mean, all of this is um, is is you know fairly easy. We're actually going to do it for sickle. Uh, I have no plans to do it for hip. Um, maybe some other people do. And then. So we, we wrote this uh, proof of concept thing and we, we put it, uh, that's actually not accurate. It was last year published at PACT. And um, <clears throat> a couple of those things that we wrote for this are upstream already. Other things are still under preparation. But these are, these are examples. So this is a CUDA code, SU3, unmodified CUDA code run on the, G, uh, on the CPU. So usually you can't really run your CUDA code on, on CPUs. That's not a thing anymore. I mean, there's tools out there that may help you, but you can do it. And then you can use host tooling like GDP just on the, on the CPU and can stop your, your CUDA program and look into it with comp like just generic host tooling. Here is some runtime results. This is XSBench, a proxy application for Monte Carlo um, uh, nuclear reactor simulation like OpenMC. And so what you see here, vendor CC is the, the vendor compiler for the, the specific architecture. So here NVIDIA's NVCC, and here uh, HIP, uh, AMD HIP compiler. Uh, Clang CC is using Clang, our Clang, to compile the respective uh, file. And CUDA OMP is our go through, through OpenMP path. So on, on NVIDIA, all of them use CUDA as an input. On AMD, the first two use HIP as an input, and we use CUDA as an input, right? That's kind of the whole spiel. We use CUDA, right? And what you see is we're actually faster on both. Why are we faster? Because of our um, math library. Turns out there is an XS bench. If you have a, an actual math library, the compiler is able to do some more stuff because it knows math calls. And if you don't have a math library, it doesn't. So it's art, an artifact, but still cool. And then here on Lulesh, we are on par with Clang on the NVIDIA side. So that's good. So this is roughly what you would expect. We should get the same performance as Clang um, all the time. That's, that's what I would expect. So we're on par with Clang here. It's slower than NVCC, but you know, different apples and oranges, different compiler, that's fine. And on the AMD side, we're actually slower than Clang. Why are we slower? Because when we did the experiments, we didn't yet have stream support, like asynchronous offloading for AMD. That has been resolved, so we haven't redone the experiment, but I'm assuming, but I'm assuming we caught up fully now, because now we have fully full stream support. On NVIDIA, we had stream support already, so that is why the, here it worked, but there it didn't. But that was just an artifact. Okay, now let's talk about um, everyone using the hardware to the fullest if without you know, concentrating on it, right? So this is a new thing that we started a while ago, not that long. And um, I like to talk about it because I think there's a lot of potential, even though we can't, we can't prove it yet. But I think there's potential, and I think people should be excited about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm presenting it. Uh, so we call it direct GPU compilation, or GPU first. And the idea is um, we want to take a legacy CPU app, whatever you have currently, what your app does, how it is as a, right now, without you know, porting it to CUDA or any GPU thing, you want to take it as it is, and you don't modify it at all, but you just compile it with our Clang, and you, ex you get an executable that runs entirely, entirely, your main function starts on a GPU. Your entire program runs on a GPU. You didn't modify anything. You just take your program and run it on a GPU. So, because why, why would you do that? Because then you don't have to modify it. I mean, we already have the programs, we have the hardware, and all we kind of want to do is run it there because that is faster, supposedly. Um, how does that work? We, we, we have like a main wrapper, I'll show you in a second. We have a user wrapper. Those are just files that we automatically pipe into the, into the compilation process. So that is super trivial. And we have a partial libc to resolve some of the libc calls on the device. Um, it's just to make it faster. And then everything on the GPU, so when you run it, everything that is an external call, like, you know, F open, F scan F, like things that are just calls into the system libraries or external third party libraries, they don't exist in the GPU, obviously. There's no, there's no libraries, there's no shell libraries. So what do you do? We basically, during the compilation, we find all of these calls to external functions. And we replace them with effectively remote procedure calls to the host. 
pass all the arguments, including underlying memory, to the host. The host then has a thread waiting for it, um, does the actual call to whatever third party library it is. What happened? All good? Okay. Oh, yeah. Does the, does the call to whatever third party library it is, so, so basically does the f open, f scan f, whatever it is, and then we copy the stuff back. And um, that is not foolproof, so I can always write a program where this breaks. Okay, cool. But if it works for your program, do you really care? I mean, honestly, let's, let's, let's take the engineering view of this, right? So if it works for, for your program, you're good. That's, that's, that's all you care. And if it works for your program, it works for your program. There's no, like, so. Um, let's take a look at these two files that we pipe in and, and they fit on slice. This is the entire thing. This is the, um, what was it called here? Main wrapper. This is the main wrapper and this is all of it. And we pre-include that into every file that you compile. At the very beginning, effectively, we kind of, we pre-include it as the first thing such that at the very beginning of every translation unit, effectively, is this code. What does it do? It says everything that follows is please op like tell open uh, tell the compiler that everything that follows is actually compiled for the device and not for the host at all. So only compile the everything that follows for the host uh, for the device. Sorry, which then is whatever device you specify, like an SM80, a GFX908, whatever you specify, right? So this is what this says. Technically, there is uh, you you would you would need to put an end uh, declare target at the at the end of your file, but Clang is just going to issue a warning or something, and then you just ignore that. I mean, so what? We forgot the end. And then this, what does this thing do? I'm not sure if people have seen that before. It's a neat trick that basically says, if you find a symbol called main, rename it into user underscore underscore user main. That's all it does. So it's kind of a, a rename trick that renames the user function main into user main. You could do that in various ways. This is just, you know, an easy way that we that we used. And this is this is the other file that we use. And this one is a source file that we compile. Um, whenever you do the linking step to, for your program, we compile this file and we link it into your application as well. And this is the only host code, CPU code that runs. This is an actual main, so we don't rename this. This is now the new entry point of your executable. So um, what this does is effectively just map all the command line arguments onto the device such that they're available there. And then um, on the device here, start a, start a uh, target region, start a kernel, um, and on the device call user main, which is now your old main that we renamed, so that exists now as user main, and uh, pass, the, pass the values on the device for the command line arguments. Get the return value back, return it, that's it. So those two files. And if you do not have external runtime calls, this is all you need. That's it. And then you, your entire application runs on a device. It's fine, right? You wouldn't have thought it's that easy. It actually is. I'm not sure why I know what I did. OK, cool. So we did that. And then we did some measurements. This, these are results that we did for the first version of, of this. Um, direct GPU compilation, which is a paper last year at a workshop. And you can find it online. And um, Back then, we had to manually write the stubs for the device and the host for each ex function call that has to bridge, like external call. So we had to write a stub for f open on the device and a stub for f open on the host to do the communication, right? So we had like helpers for this, so it wasn't hard particularly, but you have to write it by hand. Um, and if you write it by hand, you can make it work always. You know, if you know what these functions do, you can always make it work. So what do you see here? Slowdowns. This is effectively um, slowdown of our version over the host, like running it on the host or running it over the offload, offload version. And I mean, the results are great effectively as, uh, as long as you don't read slowdown here. If it wants to speed up, everyone would be happy. <clears throat> so what does this mean? This means we make things incredibly slow, but run them on a GPU, which is, which is an interesting result to begin with. But uh, obviously this is in and of itself, not, not yet ready, not helpful, right? What do you do? The problem here is twofold. One, one problem was our programs were allowed to have parallelism, like OpenMP parallel four, right? But we mapped that only to one thread block on the device. That means even if they had parallel four everywhere, 
we only used one thread block of a device. That's not how you use a GPU. So we, we basically miss you, like, used the GPU wrong to begin with. And then uh, all the sequential parts in a program are especially slow. So we, Amdahl's law is, is, you know, telling us don't do this, and then we don't even use the parallelism right. Okay, so that, that's the reason why these experiments were a little bad. Now, so we went, we went a different way. So, so then we did, a, a, this is now results for automagic remote calls. And this is um, just looking at the parallel region slash kernel of proxy apps. So, so we just said, okay, now whenever we have a parallel for, or, or a parallel, instead of mapping it only one thread block, we map it to the entire GPU. We start a new kernel that runs on the entire GPU and then you have like a lot of parallelism. That is not always that great either because parallel four in you know, CPU applications oftentimes has parallelism at the order of magnitude of like 100. And what we want is the order of magnitude of like 10,000. So anyway, so we did this. And then what we, why did we do this? So what we can now compare the performance of a, a manually offloaded version, like the kernel in a manually offloaded version, versus just the parallel region in the automatically offloaded version. And you can do, why would you do that? Because you can estimate how well your application is going to scale on a GPU if you just map this, like this parallel four, replace it with target teams distribute parallel four. Will it work? It, will it scale? And you can do that without manually managing all the data and so on. So you can predict the scalability ahead of time. And then you, if it doesn't scale, you can modify your data layout easily, or you can modify your algorithm and try it again. So you don't have to redo like all the data mapping and so on. And then what you see here is roughly, it's always pairs of two in the bars. You see that manually offloaded and automatically offloaded are pretty similar as soon as we go to the large data input size. We are somewhat faster on the small input size, which is okay. Um, but, but the funny thing is on XS Bench and RS Bench on the host, there exists uh, a history mode. On the device, in the, in the, in the GPU version, it does not. So it's just a different way to compute the same thing. But now we can basically predict how well would the history mode do on GPUs. Now, the, we talked to the authors and the OpenMC uh, author. Uh, these results are a little misleading because we would need to scale out further to see that history mode doesn't do that well. But technically speaking, we could have scaled out further, except that XS Bench and RS Bench are not set up to have bigger data sets. But we could. Like the author could just give us a bigger data set and then we could just run it on a bigger data set and see if it scales, right? <laughs> okay, this is an example from a spec CPU benchmark. And again, same, same spiel, parallel region versus, uh, um, on a GPU. And what you see here is <clears throat> that um, CPU performance is basically at one and this is slowdown against CPU performance. But the, tr the, the trick here is what you want to see is, and, and this is input size. So we, we increase the input size. So we want to see if, we, if it scales, right? And it scales up to roughly here, right? And it's, scaling means it's linear. So the, the performance, like on the, on the CPU, it scales nicely. So we know that. And now if it scales nicely on the GPU, the, the, aver like the, the ratio, CPU performance versus GPU performance should be, this, like, should be, should be flat. So we want to see a flat line here. Then we know our algorithm is going to scale on a GPU for bigger input sizes and so on and so forth. And then you see at some point here, it goes away. And, and you can, you, I mean, you see the trajectory. This is, this is not going to go anywhere, which means that if you increase the input size, this algorithm is going to not perform well on a GPU. And it's not surprising if I tell you what they did. They did producer consumer um, between parallel things. Uh, between parallel threads, which works reasonably well on a couple of threads on a host, but then gets into problems on the device. And I mean, if people didn't know what they did or, or, or whatever, or the, the algorithm might be more complex, you can actually run this study easily. And it's just running it with different sizes and taking the, the NVPROF measurement. I mean, it's trivial. Um, and then you can predict, will it work or will it not work? And then you can modify your algorithm and see again. Oh yeah. Now that we have the ability to run re generic programs on a GPU, let's see where that leads us. I mean, there's a lot of generic programs that you could now run on a GPU, right? 
One of these are, is the LLVM test suite, which is full of C and C++ programs. Why, wouldn't I, why, wouldn't, why would I want to run them on a GPU? There's two reasons, well, three kind of. One, it's cool. Let's start there, right? I mean, <laughs> two, I want to know what C, C++ works on a GPU. Where are, where are the bugs? I want to like, think of it. How much code do we really pipe through our compilers to go on a GPU versus we pipe through our compilers to go on an XAZ6 computer? And the more code you pipe through, the, more, the, the, the better test that your compiler is. I mean, I have more trust in our x86 backend than in our AMD GCN backend, purely based on the fact that we run orders of magnitude more code every day through that thing. And that is a, a, like a clear benefit. So if we could run more code through the backends on the GPU and the entire tool chain, that would be good. And this opens up that possibility because now we don't have to wait for like a couple of kernels and always run, you know, dense linear algebra through, but we can run anything through. And the more we get to GPGPU, GPU, like actual generic compute on GPUs, the, the more important it's going to be. So um, what do you guys think? How many tests out of two, like we ran 2007 tests in the LLVM test suite. How many of those compiled, run, and verify correctly when executed on a, I don't know, A100 or something like that. Give me a number. Percentage. It's between zero and 100. No one? 50. Anyone else? No? On the compiler libraries. So, I mean, th th these tests can use like system libraries. They can do, you know, f open, f read, printf, stuff like that. Uh, but yes, they don't have third party libraries, correct. Um, so, oh, here we go 86. Which is, which is, I mean, that was just first result. Like we just run it and how do you run it? You do, I mean, everything except this line is just how you run the, the, the test suite. So, so we added this line where we effectively said, oh, by the way, use this compiler, which is just a script around Clang and use this com compiler for C++, that's it. And that's all we had to do. And here we go and then everything run and we got 86, which is cool. So what did we learn? We learned that the micro benchmarks don't work. We learned that single source is easier than multi-source. And then we started to look into the failures. What are the problems, right? Because that is part of what we, we wanted to do this. So some of the tests were simply broken. I'm not sure who wrote this, but this ain't how OpenMP works. Um, I'll give you a second. Maybe you'll figure it out. So it says parallel four, followed by f printf. Usually, that, 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 and usually we don't run the test suite with F minus F open MP, so all the programs are ignored. If you don't ignore it, it's like the compiler is just, yeah, no. Um, so so we, we fix that test, you know, then the test runs. Um, we also also a fun test that did this, which last time I checked wasn't the signature of malloc. Um, and I don't know why that goes through on the host, honestly, but it apparently did. But in our, in our tool chain, that just exploded. So it said, uh, no. Uh, you, you try to, you know, do malloc like this, this doesn't, this just doesn't work. So we fixed those tests and this actually added, I think seven or eight tests. So this was kind of, um, in multiple tests used because this is like a driver file for multiple tests, whatever. Then we hit compiler bugs where, I mean, arguably the compiler should never explode, but here an assertion was hit because here somebody used this const unsigned integer in a variable length array. Now, we don't actually actively support variable length arrays on GPUs right now, so we should at least emit an error instead of just crashing, sure. And then we had different other things. So the first one, the first category is external global. So we handle external runtime calls automatically, but we never actually went around and did external globals. We can handle them roughly the same way. There's no particular reason that shouldn't work, so we, I, I assume it's going to work. So, so we could make that happen. Exceptions. I mean, there's the easy way to handle exceptions and there's the right way of handling exceptions and we're going to implement the easy way eventually soon anyway. And that's probably just going to be fine because as long as you don't throw an exception and don't catch an exception, exceptions are super easy. 
so, so, so we're going to ex do exactly that. You know, a throw is going to be a trap and a, and a catch is going to be a no-up and, and problem solved. And then people used, actually used variadic functions and themselves ran over the var arcs arguments. Now, we can implement that too. Actually, not that hard. It doesn't work right now because none of the GPU back, like ISAS defines uh, an ABI for VARGs, so, so they, the backends are just like VARGs now. Um, but we can, we can actually, because there is no ABI, we can even implement that in any way we choose, and, and we can just pick a way and do it. So that's, that's easy peasy. Because we already support variadic function calls to the host, right? We just, you know, make them non-variadic and then call it a day. Uh, then we're unsupported types, so LVM OpenMP offload allows you to have a long double in a struct, even if that struct goes onto the GPU, as long as you don't use the long double. So if you start trying to use it, we're saying, nope, we don't have the instructions. I mean, now you can implement soft float. Why not? There's no technical reason why we couldn't do that. Uh, you could even do that with other types that are not supported. I mean, sure, we'll, we'll just do it in, in software if the, if the not works. Is it worth it? Maybe not, but doable. Inline assembly is a little harder. I mean, you can pattern match a lot of it, right? There's a lot of, uh, there's only very few inline assembly patterns a lot of people use. So you can probably catch like 80% with a couple of rules of read it. Is it this one? Then replace it with equivalent. And then for all of the other ones you haven't pattern matched, you just say, no, we can't do this. So, so that's fine. Similarly, there is intrinsics that some people used and, and so on. Overall, these are the categories of things that we could or should support on, on to get more C, C++ code onto the GPU. Cool. <clears throat> so, changing gears for a second. This has nothing to do with what I said so far. Kind of. Um, at some point, I was, still in the, I was still thinking we should help people port their code from one language to another. Now I look at this and think of it more as um, we should help people modernize their code or rewrite their code, right? IDEs, like the, the people use ML nowadays, but I, I, in ML, you have to have trust in it or you verify it. And if you start verifying it, is it really worth it? Anyway, different discussion. What we did is, especially uh, here, is effectively regular expressions, search and replace for code. What do people know? People know the language they write their application in. Let's assume that, right? And that's the only thing they should, they should need. So what we said is, this is a matcher, effectively the search pattern for a CUDA triple chevron kernel launch. So effectively, you know, there is some boilerplate. We basically just define a kernel with two arguments. Um, we then say, okay, here is a Clang matcher with, a, with, with some name and then Here's the matcher block. This is actually the code we want to match because you might need some declarations or variables here just for them to exist. So, because this has to be valid code, this has to go through Clang. And then this one is effectively a matcher for all CUDA kernel launches that use three launch parameters and two kernel arguments, right? And what Clang is, what, what the tool is going to do, it reads this with Clang, gets a Clang AST, and builds from the Clang AST a Clang AST matcher. And then with that Clang ST matcher, it goes over your code base and tries to match it. And if it matches it, it's going to take the replacer block. Now, don't be it's actually fairly easy. Replacer block, which has the same name, and it has, again, a matcher block here. So it takes this matcher block and puts it into the place where this matcher block was, was found in the application. And Inside this block here, you have n blocks, n threads, shmem, a1, a2. And these can be arbitrary expressions, right, in the language. The language says this is an expression. It could be a call of a call of a call of a call, a dereference of a dereference of a dereference, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But we match whatever it is, and we assign them the variable, like the names, these names. And then if you use them on this side, you get whatever the complex expression was here. It doesn't have to be one variable. It can be like arbitrary large. It's like search and replace with patterns. And um, what we did here is in, uh, during the translation, we multiplied the number of threads by two. So our pattern said use twice as many threads because on uh, AMD hardware, you may have twice as many, like the warp size might be twice as big. And oftentimes it's good to 
increment the number of threads by two. Sorry, multiply by two. So we did this. Um, but we only did this if it's like a one dimensional. So this is why we have this boilerplate stuff there. You could make the tool smarter to do it in the tool. It's, it doesn't really matter here. Um, and then similarly, uh, this is, like, I, I'll, I'll show you the, so you don't have to read all. This is an example to match function calls and lambdas. Um, and then it works on complicated stuff like, you know, a lambda of a, like inside a function call, a function call, and you pass to the lambda another function call. So there's, if you now try to write a regular expression, like classic regular expression for this, I mean, you I guess you can, but it's going to be hard. And if you have regular expressions matching something like this with, you know, quoted strings and so on and so forth, you're going to be, um, over multiple lines, you're going to be in deep trouble. And let's go back to a second here. Hippify does this too, right? Hippify translates these kernel things into these things. The Hippify part that deals with kernel launches is 80 lines long and does everything from pattern matching to string concatenation through Clang AST node inspection. So all sorts of shenanigans are, are in there and you still have to understand Clang and, and AST and so on and so forth. So it's, it's really complicated. And this is all kind of we wrote. I mean, it's still, still not perfect, but you, you get the idea where this is heading, right? Okay, and then, you know, when we run this matcher on this code, we get, you know, what you really want. Like all of the, the lambda is replaced, the function calls are all matched because Clang knows, Clang has a parser. Clang knows how C++ is parsed. So why don't we use the Clang to parse C++? Okay, um, we're running out of time. So record and replay. That is an upstream LLVM. Um, the idea is as follows. You have an application, you pipe in code, you pipe in input, you run it. It runs a couple of kernels. It runs them potentially multiple times, right? Now, if you want to tune those kernels, analyze those kernels, debug those kernels, what do you have to do? If you, you want to tune kernel C or debug kernel C, I mean, you have to run it all the way, all the time. And these applications might be, you know, hard to build, have a lot of dependencies, really, really hard to set up. That's a pain, and I don't, I don't like pain. So what we built is a thing that you say, you run it once and you set an environment variable and you say, record this for me. And what you get is code and input for each of the kernels. And then you can run those kernels in isolation. You can choose to run kernel B or the fifth invocation of kernel B as often as you want. You don't have to run anything else. You just run what you're interested in, your kernels. And you can then even modify that code. Technically, you can also modify the input. I can modify that code and try to debug something. You can, you know, change the code, run it again, see if it performs better. You can tune things and so on and so forth. And then we did that for tuning and then we kind of, you can even verify the results such that the, the, after the kernel call, the replay kernel call, the, the, the memory and everything is still the same, like the way it was in the original application. So you can verify your stuff. You can do timings, tuning, debugging, all of it, right? Okay, this is record and replay. Um, I have a couple of slides about AD, automatic differentiation with LLVM. I'll probably not talk about much about them. So this is, what I want to say here is, compiler technology can be used for a lot of fun things if, if people start to think outside of the box. It's not only to take C code and make it into x86 assembly. That's, that's, that's cool. But do, be free. Don't, don't think, somebody told me this doesn't work. Somebody told me, uh, or I don't think it works. Most of the things, if you, if, you, if you can think of them, there's a good chance. This is basically the idea is we did automatic differentiation inside of a compiler. So we, we basically generate the code to, gener to compute the gradient of a, of a function uh, or of your code while you run your code and you can then access the gradients and so on and so forth. And then we did this for, you know, MPI, OpenMP, OpenMP uh, parallel stuff, threading, tasking, and so on, all the parallelism models. Um, why do you want to do that in, in LLVM IR? Because this is effectively if you, here is, if you do AD right on the program, we did it on IR, but basically at the very beginning. So when IR came out of Clang, we did AD. And what happens is that most applications run out of memory. Because AD has to do, you know, value tracking and has to shadow values for all of your state and so on. So by, if you just do it naively, 
you, you have a huge memory overhead and a huge time overhead. So that's bad. But what happens if you run actually just compiler optimizations, things that we usually do, your code simplifies. I mean, that's the whole point of compiler optimization, to, to simplify your code, to, to delete that code, to make your code faster, to remove variables, to remove memory, and so on and so forth, right? So we run that stuff, and then at some point, you, you, get, you get codes here that are not like where the doing a D on them is not 6,000 times slower than the regular forward computation, like just running your program, but just, what were we, 6,000? Five times slower. And you get all the gradients for the entire program. I mean, I can live with five times if the gradients help me a lot. And obviously, this doesn't mean that this is, the, this is as good as it gets. This is just as good as it gets with, you know, a research paper. So, so it's fun. And, and again, this just to show MPI plus OpenMP, Julia MPI, Raja MPI, C++ MPI. LLVMIR has the benefit that almost every language you can think of goes into it. So if you do something on LLVMIR, you pretty much get, get access to all the languages. Some easier than others, but technically you do. Oh yeah, uh, header time optimizations. Look at that, I was, I was still pretty like then. Um, idea. I'm, I'm just giving you overviews of things that we can, you know, you might want to follow up on that, that might help you. Um, you have a file that has um, the definitions of functions. And the compiler, when it compiles those, finds out a lot about these functions. Finds out this pointer is only read, that pointer is only written. That function doesn't access memory at all. Um, this stuff about the functions. That is what the compiler does just during the compilation, but already. And then at the end of the compilation, we throw away all that information. That's it. What if we, instead of throwing that away, we put it into a header file and annotate the function's declarations with it? So we say, oh, by the way, I found out that fcx, so a complex expo exponential function, is actually read none. So it actually doesn't access any memory. And then the next time you compile your program, you read those header files in addition to, the, to everything you do otherwise, right? You just read those header files in. And by doing so, the compiler in other files that don't see the definition of F, uh, FCX, right, now knows that when you call FCX, it's not going to modify any memory. It couldn't know that otherwise by just one TU tr compilation by itself. So you had to do st stuff like LTO, thin LTO. But here you don't. Why would you do that? Uh, oh, sorry. And then we, we, we added like Clang attributes for all kind of LLVM attributes, um, which is not in Clang right now, but there is code for it somewhere else. Why would you do that? Because now you can kind of compare would this help you in terms of compile time and performance against things like thin LTO or LTO. And this is a, this is a comparison of, I think, the LLVM test suite again, running thin LTO, which is effectively a, a, a lightweight form of during link time, you can inline functions from different translation unit into your translation unit if you think you need them. Um, so on this, on this axis, these things, then thin LTO is better than um, HTO. So there, thin LTO and the whole inlining spiel is actually good, and we can't replicate the speed up. On this axis here, HTO gets a speed up and thin LTO doesn't. And here, both of them do. And in a lot of cases, we, we, we kind of can replicate the speed up thin LTO does, it gets, by just annotating functions, and it's much faster. And this is obviously also not like yet finished, so you can, you can you know, extend this further if you want. Um, right. Okay, sorry, sorry, I, I didn't know that I had this. Okay, I think I'm almost, let's do a little bit of this and then we'll, we'll stop. Um, so I promised some people I'll talk about the attributor. Uh, Attributor is a fixed-point iteration framework for interprocedural analysis in LLVM. So it's, it's kind of everything and nothing, depending on what you want it to be. The, 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 the key point of the Attributor is, one, it comes with a lot of built-in features that, that help you not to think about all the corner cases of LLVM IR on all the nasty things that could happen. And it helps you to just concentrate on what you're trying to do. And it also comes with a lot of abstract attributes, AAs, that already do a lot of the things you might want to do, and you can just grab them and get the information you need. 
So um, initially you say, I'm interested in the following information. So you want to know what is the alignment of this pointer? What is uh, the address space of this pointer? Is this function a read-only function or not? Or what, what memory does this function access? And this value here that is returned from this function, what could it be? So you, you, you specify what you want to know. And then you let it run to a fixed point, and it will then change the IR, and you can also read up the results from these AAs. So how does it, uh, how does, what, what can you annotate? You can effectively ask questions about all these, all these positions, return values, arguments, functions, call set arguments, and, and just floating SSA values, right? Okay. Let's skip that because details. This is, this is like a, some of the things that we, that you can already query that's already upstream and, and they're there. So things about what memory locations does a function access? Um, what is the potential constant range of a value? Can you give me a constant range for this? Um, talking about dominance, talking about call edges, like you can build a call graph that is effectively kind of sparse optimistic. So think of uh, inter interprocedural sparse constant propagation, right? Or SECP, just like sparse constant propagation. You start by assuming everything is dead, and then you just, you know, iterate, and because you assume everything is dead, your constant propagation is better, and because your constant propagation is better, you can prove more things dead. We do that for all of them. We assume everything is dead, we assume everything is good, everything is in a happy place, and then only if we cannot argue that anymore, we, we give up on information and, you know, go back. Is a pointer potentially null, uh, no alias? What are the potential return values of a function? And so on and so forth. You see, you see there's a lot of stuff there. Um, and then how does it, let's skip that. Um, wait, this is interesting. So attributor transparently looks through memory. If you store into like a, a, a static global and then load from the static global, we try to argue what will you load. And if we can, we will, we will just look through. So you will never see the store, and like you, the load will never pop up on your screen. You just see what was stored. Um, including like on locals, on malloc memory and so on. Like, and we deal with all the, the nastiness. We, we, we kind of make sure that you don't run into the problem that the pointer was captured as an aliasing pointer or there might be interleaving stores by other threads. We deal with all that crap. It looks through calls. So if, you're like at a, if you, you know, want to know what this value is and it depends on an argument, and if we can see all the call sites, we look what are, what are the values at all the call sites and go further there. So to, to determine what this value is, we might go look through memory, through call sites, through files, through selects, and so on. And we do all of that for you, all, all for free. Uh, not free, but we do it. Um, and then, yeah, so I have examples here. So, and then you get these nice dependency graphs where everything, you know, everything depends on AA is dead because initially we think everything is dead. So everyone has a dependency on it. And then AA is dead uses no capture and that uses potential values and that uses constant values and it simply uses value simplifies. So, so these things all depend on each other, build these circles. And that is why we do, you know, fixed point iteration, right? Um, and then I have like, this is an example out of the test suite actually, and I found that like a long time ago. So this is some code that is in there, random tree, whatever, looks good. And I ran the attributor on it a long time ago and I got like a huge speed up. So I was looking what was happening there, right? So what the attributor did, it deleted all of the, all of the code in the middle. <laughs> and I can go back and then you see, you know, it computes this new node stuff based on the node stuff and level and dim and then passes that here along and here as well and so on. But then if you go through, you realize at some point, but it's all not used. I mean, it's just used to compute the new value of the thingy. So, so everybody's like, oh, yeah, just pass, null, uh, pass zero and you know, call it a day. And, and stuff like this is kind of sometimes surprising, but it, it kind of automatically gives you all of, the, all of that reasoning. And this was the dependency graph it built for to do that, which you see, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. Oh yeah, I can't, I can't talk about this. This is, can I talk about this? Okay, so, so this is why we built the attributor. This is the reason, right? We built the attributor to optimize our OpenMP GPU runtime. So we have a GPU runtime for OpenMP that, that if you own a, own a GPU and you ask, what is my thread, what is my thread idea, right? Uh, 
on parallel, on four. Something has to do all of that logic. Something has to look at what thread am I. And that is the OpenMP um, uh, GPU runtime. And how it kind of looks is you start the kernel, and this is code that we emit. This is not user code. You start the kernel, and then we initialize some state where we say, OK, right now, there's a team size of one, and one thread is active only, right? And then we have like a barrier such that everyone sees the state, right? And then we have a parallel region and an outline function that is kind of the user, the user code, right? This is basically the user wrote on parallel with this code inside. So the user said, call the function use with my team size, which effectively is um, get um, num threads. So user wrote use um, get num threads. Okay, cool. This is what you would get. Now, because it's the LLVM, uh, like the runtime, we actually have the implementation of this parallel call here. So how is parallel implemented? It, effect it checks first the team size, because it first checks, are we in a nested parallel? If we're in a nested parallel that execute this sequentially, we'll ignore that, then change the team size. Now it's not only one thread anymore, but now it's like blocked, blocked in well, how many threads you have, right? Again, barrier, so everyone knows about it. Actually call the user function, um, barrier, and then change the team size back, okay? So far, so good, right? A lot of barriers there because we have to synchronize the state across all of our threads. Now what the attributor does, it, it first says, okay, the only right to, Team size here, um, so there was a team size here, right? Team size was looked up. Team size is a static shared memory variable. The attributor knows about the lifetime from, of shared memory on GPUs, and it knows about interprocedural reachability, and it says the only write to team size that could reach this, this load here is that guy. So you're going to read one here. One is not bigger than one, so that code is dead. Then it says similar arguments, the only write here that you can that that reaches this guy is this because of dominance reasons so this guy also reaches the, this team size one reaches here was a team size read right this guy reaches and this guy reaches but this one is always going to um overwrite whatever the other one does and you can do that back in the day we did it through interprocedural dominance now we do it through reachability with exclusion blocks I would like to get into procedural dominance in again. It's currently not upstream. Um, so we replace this. And then it says, oh, by the way, you only write this team size thing. You never read it. So let's just delete all the writes. I mean, why? Right? It's a like static lo local variable. So it, it, it says, yeah, we don't need that. So it gets rid of all of them. And then it says, oh, now you have these barriers that are next to each other and not actually, there's no, there's no non-local state effect there. So you don't need the barriers, so it deletes the barriers as well. And the fun thing is, and this is what falls out, and this is one run of the attributor. All of this happens inside of the fixed point iteration. So all of these things, basically every barrier says initially kind of, ah, I don't, you don't need me, you don't need me. Or, and the, the loads say, oh, you, you know, I'm either dead or uh, later it knows what value it reads. So all of that happens at the same time. And then if you kind of inline this one through, you get exactly what the user would have written in CUDA. So this is the good case. Does it work right now? Yes, except for a couple of caveats. For example, on AMG GPU, we are always stuck with at least one state bit. So we, we roughly have, you know, 10 variables in, in our state, not only one. Here I showed one, right? We have 10. And AMG GPUs, we are stuck with at least one. Right now, always, because there's one thing we can't do. I know what, I know how to do it. Just somebody has to sit down and do it. On, on NVIDIA, we can actually reduce all of them in simple kernels. But as soon as you, you know, add more code here, we might get, like things might get confused. And then that, that is when it doesn't work. That is where you can use, you know, assumptions and command line flags to help us. So the compiler emits remarks, optimization remarks, that say, I couldn't do something. And especially the OpenMP op remarks are important. And then you can give us like uh, annotations on your code or, or just uh, command line flags to help us do transformations. And this is, yeah, back in the day, I did the performance studies. This is where we started. And this is CUDA. And this is where we ended up, which is, you know, effectively CUDA. This is where we started. This is CUDA. Okay, we didn't, you know, make anything worse. That's good. And here we didn't have CUDA, but still, you know, 50% faster. And here we got like 
close, but not quite to CUDA. So there is still, there is still headroom. All of this wasn't, wasn't sufficient, but it gives you an idea that you can just co-design your runtime in a way and your optimizations that they, that they work together. And that's actually you know, a, a very powerful way to do, to do um, implementations. And I think I'll, keep, I'll leave it here, leave it with that.